sound that forgetful. I mean, don't want to look that forgetful. Okay. Uh, hello then. So welcome again to English history. Okay. Um, I hope you remember last time we talked about how languages can uh, can be compared from a genealogical point of view. It basically means that you're looking at the genes of a language. Yes, I know uh, the genes of a language are not identical with the genes of a speak of of the speakers of this particular language. Of course, right? We are not talking about biological genes because we know that every language can be learned by any 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 sort of population. Of course, right? So, for example, if you are a child of African origin, whichever language you happen to be introduced to uh, in your childhood, you will always learn that language, of course, even without knowing anything about the history of the language, right? Just think about, I mean, most of us here actually speak Hungarian, but I'm sure if somebody came up to you and asked you what the pheno ugric word was, or the word three, you would just be staring at them, of course, right? So, uh, knowing a history of a language is not identical to being able to speak a particular language. Okay, last time we talked about how uh, common Germanic developed from Indo-European. I, uh, yes, I know, last time was a little bit lengthy with all the sound rules, and unfortunately, or not for us and for you, uh, we will have to learn the sound rules, right? If you remember, we said that there were a number of uh, places of articulation. You had the labials, you had the coronals or the dentals or the alveolars, the palatals, the velars and the labial velars, right? And then we had a number of rules which changed all of these Indo-European uh, sounds. They are right stops. They change them into the corresponding Germanic sounds. I'm still talking about Germanic, of course, right? This is a language which has never been recorded. There are no surviving records of it. And unfortunately, we can't expect any new records to show up anytime in the future, of course. If we were ever in the position to go back in time, now that would be a real treat for someone who does historical linguistics, of course. Uh, just imagine if you had a time machine, if you were, I don't know, a Doctor Who, who just decided to jump into his TARDIS, then you could go back in time and actually check whether common Germanic really sounded anything like what we actually said last week. Uh, this will probably not happen, but at least not in the near future. So what you have to remember are the sound changes. Uh, for example, this is just a repetition, but you know that repetition never hurts. The Indo-European voiceless stops, which may have been aspirated, turned into common Germanic fricatives, right? So we had changes like per becoming a f, t becoming a th, k becoming a h. I hope you know that the name for this rule is spirantization, right? So basically a stop becoming a fricative. Then we had the voice stops, uh, Berdeger, turning into their voiceless counterparts. It's basically devoicing. It's a change in, uh, in a laryngeal feature. And then we had the voice aspirate stops, right? Rather complex structures like b, d, and right, g, which turned into either a voice stop at the beginning of a word or a voice uh, fricative uh, inside words, right? So this, this, this could also mean the end of the word, right? If you want to have some further examples, uh, I made a practice uh, quiz available. It is not anything that I'm going to Right, great, but you have a link to a book, which is actually the accompanying book to your prescribed book for this exam. It was written by the same author. It is an excellent book, right? So if you really want to dig deep into the history of this language, that book is just, just one of the first the tools that you have to have in your armory of tools for analyzing languages. So if you want to have a look at further examples, please find the practice quiz. 
Um, I think next week we are going to say a few more things about how you can distinguish um, inherited words from all of those words that have been uh, uh, popularly or right, learnedly loaned uh, during the last number of thousands of years, right? Okay, people, now I think I need to give you a little bit of a breather to come to terms with these rules, right? Because it is, after all, a, a tremendous chunk of material. And now I thought we could have a look at Old English. Is that okay? What do you say for this treat? Okay, now let's see. I'm going to share my whiteboard with you and then let us talk a little bit about Old English. Let me just ask you, can you see the whiteboard? Can I just uh, have a nod? Yes, yes you can. can. Okay, thank you. If it should disappear at any time, just make sure I get to know about this. So I just uh, shout out then. Now, however, before we do this, let me just show you, but I'm sure you can already see where we are going with this. Let us see where Old English is in this long line of development. Uh, okay, so let's see. Now, of course, you know that our universe begins with Indo-European, right? Indo-European had a number of daughter languages. Um, last time we mentioned a few, like the, the Germanic languages, the Balto Slavonic, the Indo Aryan, and so on and so forth, Albania, uh, Albanian, Greek, and so on. Now, one of these is common Germanic. It is called uh, common because it is the, if you wish, the mother language that underlies all of the Germanic languages. So if you are a Germanic language, then you must come from this um, um, mother language, right? So for example, if you speak Danish, Faroese, English, I don't know, Gothic and so on, these languages must originally all have come from this common Germanic. Now, uh, common Germanic is uh, typically subdivided into two further sub-branches. One of these is known as East Germanic, and the other one is known as North Western Germanic. Right? Now, let me ask you people, which of these uh, branches actually contains languages that are, that are still spoken? It, it will mean, of course, that one of them is actually dead. Which one of these sub-branches is dead? Does anybody know? Yes, Nicoletta? I would guess the East. Yes, because if you if you said the West Germanic branch, then I don't know what, what the language is that we are actually using for this presentation. Yes, does anybody remember or does anybody know? I don't think we have actually said the word. Which is one of the most famous East Germanic languages? They are very famous because we actually happen to have the first written evidence from it. It's a translation of the Bible, and this is absolutely vital for us. Does anybody know the name of this East Germanic language? There, there were a number of these, but the most famous one is known as, this is right, Gothic. Gothic is the, is, Gothic is the most famous East Germanic language. Why? Because it happens to be the first Germanic language to have any written data. So if you, for example, look at Gothic data, you will never find an asterisk before them, right? Why? Because those data actually appear in writing. Okay, good. Now, the Northwestern Germanic branch is subdivided into the Northern and, of course, the Western, right? These are geographical names, of course, right? Let me ask you people, can you give me a number of of the Northern Germanic languages. Let's have at least five. Just think about the map, right? Yes. Nicoletta. I'm I'm mixing these up with Celtic languages all the time, but but uh, Norwegian. Yes, of course, Norwegian. Uh, no, 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 no. This is a decent Germanic language, right? So you have Norwegian, Danish, Swedish, 
Icelandic, right? All of these are, are, uh, are northern languages. What about the western? Now, there are a number of subdivisions here. One of them is known, and this will be important for us, is known as Anglo-Frisian, right? Anglo, Anglo-Frisian. Uh, okay, before we go into Anglo-Frisian, I hope I don't have to have to remind you of this. One of you know the Western Germanic langu languages are really are really numerous. You have English, of course, and Faroese, and German, and Dutch, and all of those accents of German, of course, right? Okay. Now, Anglo-Frisian is one of the sub branches of Western Germanic, and it seems that the most closely related relative to English is actually Frisian. Does anybody know? And actually, as a matter of fact, this language is still spoken nowadays. Where is this language spoken? In which country? Does anybody know? It's a minor language, but it's still spoken. Where? Mm -hmm. Yes? It has to be somewhere close to Denmark. Very clever. Very clever. It's actually spoken in the Netherlands, right? It's one of the minor languages of the Netherlands. Yes, it is very closely related to Dutch, but it's not Dutch, right? Why? Because it seems to have uh, shared more sound changes with English than with Dutch and German and so on. Yes. Now, inside this, of course, you have ang uh, English as a matter of fact, right? Now, English originally comes from the name of one of the tribes that spoke this language. Does anybody know the three Germanic tribes that decided to settle uh, on the British Isles, thus uh, eradicating the, right, the Celtic population, ultimately, from the continent? Which are these three Germanic uh, North, actually Western Germanic tribes. Does anybody know? So if you think about this, this is what it looks like, right? This, these are the British Isles. So you have over here is like Kent. Here you, you have London, and then of course you have the continent. Does anybody know the names of the three Germanic tribes that decided to settle on the British Isles? Any ideas? I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. That's but, okay. Uh, I think I think it's the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. And the Jutes, yes, exactly. So what you actually have are the Jutes. You have the Saxons, and you have the Angles, right? They are not angels, right? They are Angles. Yes, that's right. Now, uh, the Angles actually settled uh, settled somewhere here, right? It seems the Jutes settled somewhere around Kent, and the Saxons seem to have settled in the remaining part of the country. So basically, Anglian was one of the major uh, dialects of Old English, right? Actually, Anglian was the, the dialect which was spoken by the uh, by a huge number of the population. Actually, Anglian extended from London, so from Saxon and Jew, I mean, from the Saxons and the Jutes up to Scotland. So it, so it was a huge dialect area, right? Okay, so basically, uh, can you see that when we say that we speak English, we actually are historically referring to only to one of the major uh, accents or di dialects of old English, English that happened to have been spoken by the Angles. Um, what do you think would be the name of the language if we were to continue the language of the Saxons? I always ask this because the term is very funny, as a matter of fact. We would be speaking Saxish. Not Saxish, but Saxish, right? Exactly. So basically, if we were to continue the uh, language of the Saxons, we would be speaking right Saxish. Of course, you can ask me why do we actually have this change from A to E? This is a regular Old English 
sound change that changed every A to E. If you are interested in this, this is called E umlaut. Does it ring a bell to any fans of the Germanic languages? Yes. Very, very good, Nicoletta. So basically, if you think about one very good example for E umlaut in Old English, then this word would be that particular example, right? Okay, if you are asking me what this means, please go to the book and check it, right? The book actually has a number of pages on this very early Old English sound change. Okay, good. Uh, if we were to speak, right, Jutish, I don't know what the pronunciation would be, right? Probably like Jutish. I have no idea, of course. Okay, but we speak English. Okay, now, so uh, then let us see what happened. Now, one of the earliest periods is known as Old English. Please remember, Old English is not a uniform language, as we have just said. It was composed of these three major dialect areas, uh, Saxon English, Angles and Rajuts. Okay. Now, does anybody know when did these three uh, tribes sort of roughly decide to settle on the British Isles? Which century? Does anybody have an idea? Actually, we have somebody, it was an old English scribe who gives us an exact right year, but we can never actually be sure about that. Does anybody know? It's uh, 449. So this is the 5th century, the middle of the 5th century. Of course, we are talking about AD or common era, of course, right? OK, uh, so Old English sort of starts from around the 5th century AD, right? OK, does anybody know when do the first written evidence show up for Old English? Which century? That's okay. It happens to be around the seventh, uh, eighth centuries. So this is rather early. Does anybody know which piece of a very famous poem is actually one of the first attestations of uh, Old English? Yes? Maybe Beowulf. It is Beowulf, that's right. So basically, basically, that's why we are very happy to have it, because it gives us a unprecedented glimpse into a very early stage of uh, Old English. People actually study Beowulf, say that it must have been written somewhere in, in the 7th century. So this is very uh, old indeed. OK, has anybody read Beowulf? Mm, it's not your... Uh, usual bedtime story, right? It is really terrifying, it's really terrible, but of course if you do historical linguistics you don't really read for the subject matter, you are, re you are, you are searching for all the inflections, the cases, the nouns, the secondary stresses, the primary stresses and God knows what. Okay, does anybody know what the name itself means, right? Beowulf? Hmm. It means Beowulf, which is in turn, it means bear. That's right. So, so basically Beowulf means, means the wolf of the bees, and that's a bear, right? Yes, okay. You understand that it is, so it's, you, I'm sure you understand that bears attack bees, so, so bears are the wolves of the bees, right? So so that's why it's called bear wolf. That's the name of one of the uh, personae in there. Okay, good. Let me ask you people, how long does Old English actually go for? Sort of. 1066. Ah, very good, Nicoletta. Yes, this is actually the uh, day when Anglo-Normans come to England. Of course, you can imagine that everybody was scared out of their wits and they actually forgot speaking Old English. But this is not usually what we say, because Old English must have existed and must have extended into the reign of the 
Anglo-Normans. So that's why we say that uh, Old English uh, comes to an end uh, at around 1100. So that's another 50 years after the Norman conquest. I'm sure you understand the importance of, of the Norman conquest. It's when a new ruling elite comes and subjugates Anglo-Saxon England. Let me ask you people, I just have to make sure that you understand this, although this is not part of the changes that we are discussing here. Where do the Anglo-Normans actually come from? Which part of Europe? Hmm? You know, is it uh, Scandinavia? Is it Germany? Is it Spain? No, it is right France, uh, uh, North Western France, right? So basically this is a French speaking aristocratic elite. Uh, does anybody remember the name of the king who was imposed upon Anglo-Saxon England? William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror, who actually happens to have been William the First, of course, right? Yes, because that's a continental name. Uh, he, I mean, that name wasn't used in Anglo-Saxon England. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to speak about this because, as you know, right, history doesn't really have an impact on the language itself. Of course, uh, any particular language may actually start uh, borrowing words from a more dominant language, but the language itself will never be changed because of this, right? So, so you will still have, I don't know, uh, gender and case and so on. Now, let me ask you people, can you think of any, any words that ultimately come from Anglo-Norman? Yes, I know I'm asking a very, I don't know, interesting question, because if we were to continue giving examples, we would be spending the rest of our lives here. Let us just have five. Can anybody give me five examples of words that ultimately come from Anglo-Norman, which means that they are not of old English origin? Yes. Come on, people. It's your turn to show off your non-old English knowledge here. Yes. Hmm? Well, you have, yes, Nicoletta, can you That's think of any? School. Ah, well, school is probably, right, a learned borrowing from Latin. Uh, yes, could be, could be. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it comes from Anglo-Norman. Okay, people, think about the names of the foods. What if you have, right, a pig, what's the name of the meat that you eat? Pork, of course, right? Pork is an Anglo-Norman word. Okay, if you, for example, have, right, a calf, the offspring of a cow and a bull, what's the name of the meat that you have from a calf? Because bull and cow are too old to be cooked, right? It's what? Beef, of course, right? Yes, so that's a French word. I mean, an Anglo-Norman word, beef. Anything else? Think about aristocratic titles. Yeah, Not the... Hmm? Yes? Those, um, like, from George. From George? Like, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, what do you mean from George? Like, uh, the words and objects that are coming from the church vocabulary. Ch yeah, but... but don't forget that Old English were Catholic, they were right Christian. This wasn't new to them, right? This wasn't new to them. Okay, think about the aristocratic titles like Duke and Duchess, but not King and Queen. That's Old English, right? King and Queen. Okay, think about words like chamber, think about words like chant, and so on and so forth, right? Even so, if we started doing this listing, we would be spending the rest of our lives here, right? Because the list goes on and on and on. Okay, people, but still, Old English and English have stayed the same language. Okay, let's go on. Now, after Old English, you have Middle English, right? We start at around 1100 and extend until what? Does anybody know? Hmm?
What? About the 16th century, maybe? About the 16th century, yes. Uh, well, a convenient point is like 1500, but we can't really be sure, of course, right? Because this uh, classification is never observed when you are a speaker of this langu language. So if you ask an Old English speaker, if they ever noticed Old English becoming m Middle English, the answer would be no, of course, right? This classification is always done by, of course, linguists who look at all of this cases that change, all of the suffixes that change, and then they say, unfortunately, this language can no longer be called Old English, let's call it Middle English. I mean, this is not, this This doesn't happen from a Sunday to a Monday, of course, right? In spite of the fact that we can try to think about this like this. Think, think, of, think again about uh, common Germanic becoming common Germanic from Indo-European. This didn't happen from a Sunday to a Monday. This must have been existing for a very long time. Some speakers still had the per, other speakers uh, already had a fur, and then at one stage all of the speakers that had fur actually disappeared, and then every new speaker actually had a fur. And then, and then you say, ah, this is the point where the language change actually happened, right? Of course, you can think of this as fairy godmother coming to you during night and saying, now from eight o'clock in the morning you are going to speak Middle English. This is what you can actually imagine to have happened, but we know that this is not the, tr the truth behind this. Okay, can anybody give me a very famous person who wrote in Middle English? There were a number of them, of course, right? Which is the one that we like, whose uh, stories we still love reading? Shakespeare? No. Chaucer? No. Yes. Chaucer. Chaucer. Chaucer and his uh, Canterbury Tales, of course, right? That's a famous piece of work. It contains uh, 24 stories and 17,000 lines. It's a major piece of Middle English literature, and we absolutely love Chaucer because Chaucer offers us an insight onto this past stage of the language. Okay, some people actually say that this is not the this is not the beginning of the 16th century. We can't really be sure. Okay, what comes after Middle English? Early Modern English, right? It's known as Early Modern English. It starts at around 1500 or 1550, or some people even say 1600, and goes uh, and goes until what? Does anybody know? Sort of. Hmm? Of course, you you have a very famous uh, poet here and. Uh, Playwright, and this is now Shakespeare, of course, right? Shakespeare speaks or spoke uh, early modern English. Opinions differ, but early modern English sort of comes to an end at around 1750. But dates will, of course, differ. It depends on the on the tradition that you follow. Uh, we can't really be sure, but if you look at uh, Shakespeare and if you compare any short piece of text to what we would actually be producing nowadays, it is really strikingly different, right? F both in terms of syntax and f phonology, of course. Spelling is not interesting because spelling can come and go, uh, but some of the features are really there that really show a contrast. Okay, and then after that we have modern English. Yeah. And, and this is what we actually speak nowadays, right? In spite of the fact that, for example, if you look at somebody writing in the 19th century, it can be rather strikingly different to what we have nowadays, but still, we would still consider the change not to have been a catastrophic change to call our language something different. And I have no idea what the next term will be. I don't know what, super modern English? Right, hyper modern English, super hyper modern English. I have absolutely no idea. But of course, we will probably not right live to see a new term being coined, right? Because by that time, by the time a new a term is coined, we will already have been dead then. But that's okay. This is how things are in the universe. All things are born and we all die in the end, right? 
Okay, people. Now, so can you actually see that when you talk about a modern English word being able to be traced back to Indo-European, this is what you actually have in mind, right? Um, modern English going back to early modern English, going back to middle English, going back to old English, going back to Anglian, all right, Saxon, we can't always be sure, going back to anglo frisian going back, back to Western Germanic, going back to Northwestern Germanic, going back to Common Germanic and going back to Indo-European. Can you act actually see that with the help of sound changes, you can actually write uh, on the back of a number of thousands of years, right? This is a fun fantastic achievement. And this achievement is something that we're still going to say a few words about uh, next week. Uh, and all this is because of sound rules. I'm sorry, people, if you are serious about doing historical linguistics, it will always have to involve sound rules, you know, regular sound changes of of uh, spirantization, depocalization, blah, 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 all of those things that we already talked about. OK, but don't feel I mean, this may look, of course, like daunting, but don't don't uh, be afraid. You just have to go with the flow, as we say. OK, people, so far, so good. Now let's go on. Now let us look at this piece of text that I have for you. It's actually the Lord's Prayer, you know, if you, yes, this is a famous piece of text. It's a wonderful piece of text. We are not talking about the subject matter of the text, of course, but you know that this is an, this is a invocation to God, right? To Lord, to the Lord. Now, let us actually start from this early modern English version from around the 17th century. As a matter of fact, this version comes from the so-called authorized version of the Bible, right? It's actually called the AV. AV means authorized version of the Bible. And this was, okay, does uh, anybody know who uh, was responsible for giving the permission for this authorized version of the Bible to be uh, published? Hmm. And it is not linguistics. I'm just interested to see if you know. King uh, one Jane, the who, yes? Okay. Sorry, I wanted to say James, but I'm not sure if... Very good, thank you. Second yes, or... it is King James I. King James I comes after which famous ruler? Queen Elizabeth I, right? And, I mean, King James I is not the son of Queen Elizabeth I, because we know uh, Queen Elizabeth was never married. Uh, King James actually comes from, a, from, from her... Uh, her father's sister's uh, branch of the family. King James is actually King James the sixth of Scotland. So King James is already Scotland, uh, 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 Scotland's king, and he now comes to England to rule. And at this point, uh, England and Scotland are not actually sitting in the same union. That's why we have the Kingdom of England and we have the Kingdom of Scotland, right? So this is not yet. Great Britain. Does anybody know when uh, Great Britain actually comes into existence? You have to wait another hundred years in 1707. Now, this is when the uh, United uh, Kingdoms of Scotland and England actually come to be referred to as, as uh, uh, Great Britain. OK, let me ask you people. You know, we, we can talk about all sorts of things around here. The word Britain and the word British. Which uh, language do these two words actually come from? Is it a Germanic word? No. Is it an anglo norman word? No. It's a Celtic word, right? So basically the only, only vivid reminder of the Celts is the name itself, right? This is very interesting. Interesting, right? So it seems that the Germanic uh, population managed to uh, subjugate the Celts, but the name is still around, right? Yes. Okay, good. 
Thank you. So this comes from the authorized version of the Bible from 1618. This is when King James I actually uh, allows the publication of this. Please note that this is the time when Shakespeare Shakespeare writes his, his uh, pieces of work. Uh, actually, if you compare the text of the Bible to Shakespeare's text, uh, the text of the Bible will always sound more traditional, more more okay. Why? Because this is the job of the Bible, it seems, right? And it seems that, uh, for example, the third person singular suffix in the Bible is still th and not s. Whereas for uh, Shakespeare, both th and s are perfectly okay. But it seems that King James I actually thought, let us not use th because this is very modern. Let us use the old fashioned suffix here, right? Okay, that's why if you read the Bible, the word for the third person singular indicative present of the verb kill, because you know that the verb kill does appear in the Bible very often indeed. What is the third person singular present of the verb kill in the Bible? It's not kills, the pronunciation is killeth, killeth, right? Killeth. Okay. That's something that you will have to live with, right? Okay, now let's look at this piece of text. It says, Our Father, which art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is rather well known, right? OK, people, can you spot a number of interesting things around this piece of text? We will not analyze it exhaustively. I just want to see, I just want to make you uh, prepared for the shock that you will experience for Old English. So can you spot anything? Yes? Come on, don't be afraid. I am not biting heads off, am I? There's art in, in, in heaven. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, this is actually what? I think that's uh, the um, conjugated form of R. Yes. Uh, this is actually the verb be, right? The verb be, the, the second person singular, right? Uh huh. Okay. Can anybody spot anything else? Thy. Thy. What is thy? Maybe article B. It behaves like an uh, article. This is the possessive, the second person singular possessive, your. Right? Your. Okay, so it's thy name, meaning your name, thy kingdom. Let me ask you this, people. Sometimes this will also appear like thine. Does anybody know what it depends on? Hmm? Well, thine, yes? Maybe it's for plural? No, I have to disappoint you, no. This distribution was a phonologically based distribution. Thy was found before a consonant and thine was found before a vowel. So, for example, if you read Shakespeare, Shakespeare will have for your apple, it will be thine apple, but your desk will be thy desk and not thine desk and thy, thy apple. So this is a phonologically based distribution back then for Shakespeare. So please, people, if you read Shakespeare, which you do, I'm sure, then try to find this, right? So you have both thy and thine, but the distribution was a phonologically based one. Okay, let's go on. What else? Something that seems uh, strikingly different, something that you wouldn't have, of course, nowadays. Hmm? Is it uh, in Earth? We would say on Earth, I think. Yes, yes, that's true. Yes, this probably shows a different use of the preposition. Good. Uh, anything else? Sentence structure? Uh, which, which one? Give us 
this day our daily bread and that would be give us our daily bread this day. Yes, that's OK. This is like syntax. What what would you say? Yes, fine, fine, fine. What about this one? What's that? Thy will, meaning your will be done. What's that? Yes, this is the verb be, but which which like the mood of the verb? Is it the indicative mood, the imperative mood, or the subjunctive mood? It's imperative. No. No? No. No, because thy will is a third person singular. You cannot boss any third person singular things about. So the imperative only exists for the second persons. You, you, but not me and not him. This is the subjunctive people. Does the term ring a bell? Well, if it doesn't, it's because the subjunctive is almost as good as dead. It's as dead as a dodo nowadays, right? It can only, only be found in certain uh, fixed expressions. But in the Bible, the, the subjunctive is still, is still alive. Let me ask you people, uh, those of you who speak Hungarian, what's the Hungarian word for subjunctive? Hello? Planet Earth calling planet Mars. Kötőmód in Hungarian, subjunctive. It is used after certain verbs, after certain adjectives, uh, and so on. Uh, please note that, especially in American English, which is more conservative than British English, the present tense subjunctive is still alive. Can anybody find me examples for that? Especially used after certain adjectives and verbs. It is imperative that Peter come to the meeting and not comes. Peter come to the meeting. It is imperative that Peter be informed. Are you with me? Please, I don't want to lose you now. I don't want to lose you over the use of the subjunctive. So the subjunctive is, is almost as good as dead. It still survives in, in American English. What does uh, British English actually have instead of the subjunctive? And that's a major change that happened. British English uses some of the models, especially should. You know, it is vital, it is imperative that Peter should come. It is imperative that Peter should be informed. Is that okay, people? So this is the subjunctive. It's not the imperative. It is actually a finite verb form. It is person, number, tense, and mood, of course, right? Yes. So thy will be done. Uh, thy kingdom come. Right? This is again third person singular present subjunctive. If you speak Hungarian, jöjjön uh, el a te országod, right? That's, that's, that's the subjunctive in Hungarian, right? Okay. If you come from a Christian background, then you know that whichever language you speak, you will always have to use the subjunctive in it, right? Why? Because this is, is, this is required uh, by the text, because you're actually are asking for something to happen. And when you are doing something unreal, you use the subjunctive for it, right? So this is not the imperative. Very good. Anything else? But of course, the text is pretty much easy to understand, right? If you if you don't consider things like B and so on. Uh, can you actually see that the passive is already around? Thy will be done, meaning thy will should be done. That's the passive, of course, right? Then you have the verb do, which appears in its uh, third form. That's the passive uh, uh, participle here, done. Okay, good. Um, sorry, yes. I, I, I want to ask, um, the word die, it, it seems to be used both as a possessive pronoun and a subject pronoun. Um, is no, that where, where? Because uh, you see, thy kingdom come, and that is, is, and thy. This is the pos this is the possessive. So, so this is the noun phrase, right? Thy will, meaning oh, meaning okay, okay. your intention. Okay. Oh, oh, I see. It. I see you. So, you actually thought that will is a verb here. No, 
it is the noun, your will, right? Uh -huh. So this is the noun. So this is like the noun phrase, and thy kingdom is just another noun phrase. Okay, is it okay? Don't don't be surprised, right? Because will still survives both as a noun, you know, your will, and it survives also as one of our models, right? He will do this. Okay, people. Now let us look into into Middle English. <laughs> we are going back in time. It is a uh, Wycliffe's. Uh, uh, translation. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, this isn't the 13th century, this is the 14th one, right? Okay, now, of course, the spelling is can be different at places. Now, I am going to say it as Middle English probably had it, right? Okay, so, Ore Fadir, Fad Art in Heavenes, Halloween, B. C. Name. The kingdom cumto, be the will do non erde as in is in as as in heaven. Give us this day our bread, other other substance, and for give to us our debtis, as we for even to our debtoris, and let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. This is Middle English. Right? I know. Don't look that shocked here, right? Okay. So, yes. Can you see that spelling is still there to help you? The, the pronunciation changed a great deal. Why? Because between uh, Chaucer and Shakespeare, so between the authorized version of the Bible and this uh, version of the Bible, a number of hundreds of years have passed, and this is a huge time, and a number of sound changes happened. One of the most important ones is a so-called great vowel shift, which actually shifted all of the long Middle English vowels. So that's why Middle English sounds strikingly different. We are going to read a short excerpt from the Canterbury Tales, let me just give you the first uh, five or six lines of the Canterbury Tales and just let me ask you if you can actually spot what the whole thing is about. So, uh, so it goes right. Right, one that April with his sure sote, the drucht of March had perced to the rote, and bathed every vine in sweet liquor, of which virtue engendered is the floor. Thun long and folk to gone or to pilgrimages, to fairness thrown the schools in sundry londes. Mm -hmm. This is Middle English. This is uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Did you get anything? It's perfectly okay to say no. Okay. Okay, but if you did, then you have then you have uh, quite a thing going for this language, right? Yes. Okay. Why? Because the pronunciation changed a great deal, right? For example, if I say the word shores, what word is that? Shores. This is what Chaucer actually has in the first line of the Canterbury text. Like, one that April with his shores sorte. Hmm, shores is showers. Showers, right? Mm -hmm. Showers, shores. One that April with his shores sorte. Uh, the drucht of March hath perse to the rote. Right, drucht is the word drought, right, dryness, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's perfectly okay. Now, let us go into Old English. Now, this is Old English, which looks more terrifying than it actually is. This is a piece of text in which I marked the length marks because in, an, because in a usual, in an ordinary piece of Old English text, length marks are not shown. Why? Because it seems that those speakers didn't care about showing length marks. Why? Because they spoke that language, of course, right? So, for example, short vowels and long vowels are not systematically uh, distinguished in the manuscripts. But for uh, our right pleasure, I actually indicated the length marks. Can you also see that, that I indicated the stresses? Uh, stresses are never shown in Old English. And this is something that Old English has in 
common with modern English. Stresses are never shown. Right? Think about words like right, record as opposed to record. Stresses are never shown. To the ultimate dismay of language learners that can never learn the difference between a noun and a verb in English, right? That's a record, but it is to record and not to write record. Okay, that's that's something that Old English has in common with modern English. Um, look at this one. Does anybody know what this is? Yes. It's a thorn. It's a thorn. It's called thorn. 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 It's something that you have on the stalk of a right a rose, a prickly thing, because it looks like a thorn. And this is an ancient Germanic runic symbol, and it is used for both th and the, meaning the voiceless th and the and the voiced the. Okay. Good. So when you see this, this is not a per. This is actually th, th, if it is at the beginning of a word or at the end of a word, right? Generally. Okay, people. If you see this, because it will also be found sometimes, I'm not sure if it is actually here, but it can be. Does anybody know the name for this, uh, for this symbol? This is not a runic symbol. This comes from Irish English. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This comes from. Uh, Irish spelling. This is known as a bard D. Bard, right? Bard. And the pronunciation is exactly like these two. Of course, you can ask me, why did they actually have two symbols for the same sound? Just because. This is what happens in spelling systems, right? So basically, the thorn and the bard D show the same sound whose pronunciation depends on its phonological position. OK. <clears throat> Can you see this? Oh, oh, yes, it does actually appear here, right? OK. Uh, what is this? If you have a little uh, dot over the G, it's Y. Yeah, you can ask me, of course, why didn't they actually use the yod? Because they didn't have the yod. Why did they, why did they not use the y? Now, if you see this in Old English, the y, that's not a consonant. That's a that's a vowel. U. So this is not y. That's u in Old English. So this. Uh, Dotted year is actually year. Of course, uh, of course, you can ask me why did they have to use a G to have the year? Because some Old English years actually come from G. Mm -hmm. OK, and then you can ask me why didn't they actually distinguish them? Because they knew which one was a year and which one was a G. OK, so anyway, spelling systems can be mysterious. Good. Now, if you disregard all of these uh, secondary editorial marks that they actually gave you, the original text is like this. The original text is like this. See? So it looks like this. There are no stresses. There are no right length marks. There are no dots on the G's. And then, of course, you can ask me if I were, I mean, if you were to read this out, how will you know whether a G, sorry, whether a G, the letter G is actually a G or not? You have to know the history of the language, right? But you, you will not be required to read out Old English, right? If you, if you are, then I will always show the editorial marks, because to be able to read out Old English, you have to know the etymology of every of every one of the words there. I know it's not fair, but it takes a fair number of years to master Old English. OK, and what did it look like in actual spelling? Now, this is Old English. See, this is not a very lovely uh, photo, uh, but this is what it looks like. 
it's it's not impossible to read it. You have to know a number of conventions, right? Okay. Don't 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 be disheartened. Okay. Now let us look at the. Let us look now at the uh, Lord's Prayer in Old English, right? It says, Father, ore thou the earth on heavenum, si thy name ye hallowed, do be come thy riche, ye worth thy will on earthan, swa swa on heavenum, urne ye dequam lich an chlaf, thou sule us to dei. And for you to us ure gultas, swa swa we for you vath ure gultendum. And ne ye lath to us on kosnunge, ak alus us of uvele, soth liche. This is Old English. Hmm. Okay. Let's, let's talk a little bit about these uh, these words here. Is there anything that you can actually recognize as a word which is continued into modern English? Yes, Nicoletta, what would you say? Father. Father. How, how, however it's pronounced. Yes, it is actually a der. There was a sound change that changed this a der to a the, but that's the same word, right? This is the word uh, father, and if you now remember uh, right, Grimm's laws, then you know it goes back to Indo-European, and of course from Indo-European you have the Latin word pater. Now that's the same word, right? Okay, any other words? And? Uh, what's that? The the word and. Yes, that's right. Okay, let's go on. Ure or ur. What's that? Our. Right? It's father, our, meaning our father. Okay. Uh, thu. What do you think thu is? This is the second person singular pronoun, meaning you, which was right, thou. Uh, you know, if you read Shakespeare, then you know that the second person singular pronoun is thou for Shakespeare. This actually comes from Old English thou. I know, but everything is regular, right? Thou. Okay. E e Eart is the one of the forms of the verb be, right? As you said, Nicoletta. Yes, what else? Can you see the can you see the word nama? This is name, it's still around. Fien is the word thine. This is the one that we discussed ten minutes ago, right? Fien is middle English thine. Yes. What else? You have the word willa, right, will. Fien is again thine. Eordan, earth. And you have a suffix there. What is the word swa? It is not right schwa, it's swa swa. Does it word still survive? So yes. Us. No, so, so, so. They just repeat it for some mysterious reason, right? So be it, right? So, so. Swa, swa. Okay, then you have the word helvonum. What's that? At, at least, what's the base of the word? Oh, it's heaven. Heaven. Very lovely. Well, at least something remains of it into modern English, right? Heaven. Good. Yedeichwam uh, lichan. Now, that's a long word. Can you actually spot the base of the word? Day, day is day, meaning daily, right? Day, day. Uh, okay, what is the word chlaf? Chlaf. That's supposed to be bread. Yes, does anybody recognize the word? It's still around. There was a phonological change that did something to the beginning of the word, but the word is still around. Uh, loaf, 
as in a loaf of bread, right? Chlaf, chlaf. Okay. Uh, uh, sule. This this one is difficult. This actually is the verb. Uh, I mean, the m meaning is the verb give, but this is the this is the verb to sell. Sell. The original meaning of the verb sell was to give, not to give something in exchange for money. This was just to give, right? Okay. Us. Uh, okay, it's still around, spelled the same way. Today, today, of course, right? Well, at least something is around, right? Okay. For youth, forgive, interesting. Okay, thu is you, us is us, ure is blah, blah, blah. What is the word gult? This word is not, uh, this word is, is I'm, I'm sorry, this word is around. Which one is it? Guilt, guilt, meaning right, trespass, guilt. Okay. Uh, right, of course, when we have, of course, that's swa swa for you was. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, right, so you have the word, uh, you have the word way. That's we, of course, right? For you was, urum gültendum. Well, this word was exchanged with the French word, right, debtors, somebody who owes you something, right? But it's the same stem as the word guilt. So you owe some something to somebody in the same way as they owe that to you, right? Uh, yeah, lad. Yeah, it's not there anymore, but the, but the verb lad, lead, lead, right? Meaning to, to usher in, to make somebody move in that direction. Thu, that's uh, thou, meaning you, second person singular, us, blah, 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 kostnung. Well, this word doesn't exist anymore, right? No, yes. It's actually, uh, it's actually, it was supplanted with the French word temptation. Now that's a French word, right? Temptation in Middle English. Alus meaning to to let us uh, loose. So this is the same word as the, as the word loose, meaning to to let somebody go loose. Uh, uvele, evil, right? What about uh, what about sorthliche? Mm. Does anybody know this word? Because this is actually made up of three parts: sorth, leech, and air. Does anybody know the word sooth, as in the word soothsayer, someone who gives you the truth? So sooth, the word sooth, uh, the original meaning of the word was the truth, as it's still preserved in, in the word soothsayer, someone who gives you the right, the truth. You have the word leech. Don't be surprised. This is the this is the word lee, right? This one which is uh, used to form adjectives from nouns. Think about words like king, kingly, man, manly, uh, prince, uh, right, princely. And it is also used to form adverbs, of course, right, nice and nicely. And this is something that no longer exists. This was the adverb forming suffix, meaning like nicely, uh. It is, it is no longer a noun, right? If you speak Hungarian, this would be the Hungarian suffix for the ad, adverb, sepen, olch on, right? So, so this is the adverb forming suffix. So it actually means, right, truly, truly, truthfully. And do you remember that this word is usually substituted with the word amen, which means uh, so be it, right? Truthfully, as it is said. Okay, people, we will come back to this. I first want to talk to you a little bit and ask you about things. Let me ask you, people, uh, what about the nouns of Old English? How many genders did they have? Does anybody know? Let us now look, a, look at a bird's eye view of Old English, right? Because a lot of things have changed since then. How many uh, genders did, uh, did Old English nouns have? Can I have a show of fingers? 
Mm. Three, meaning masculine, feminine, neuter. Masculine, feminine, and neuter, right? Now, as far as Old English gender is concerned, this is not Old English right, sex, of course, right? This is Old English gender. You had masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. Let me ask you people, what did the gender depend on? I know it sounds very philosophical. What does the gender depend on? Hello? Earth calling Mars again. What do you think, Nicoletta? Think as a linguist, right? As you do. So, what did the gender depend on? Nothing. You had to remember it. Lovely. It doesn't depend on the actual sex of the thing. Of course, they had a word like bulla, which was bull. Now, that was a masculine noun. But let me give you some examples. Old English had this word. This was the word weave. This actually gives you the word wife. What do you think was the gender of the word weave? I think that was masculine. No, it was neuter. It, see, very lovely. You actually showed us what is going on in old, uh, old English sex. I mean, natural sex has nothing to do with grammatical gender. Weave was actually neuter. So, for example, if you if you speak German, this word in German is still a neuter noun. Okay, what about this word? This ultimately came to be the word woman. Now, what was the gender of the word weefman? Which was actually a compound noun uh, back in Old English, yes. This okay, was... That has to be masculine because... It was masculine, exactly. Because this is a compound noun and it's always this, the second part of the compound that actually decides on the gender of the whole noun. Yes, people, so can you actually see that the word woman was a masculine noun? Right? This is not because Old English men could not differentiate women from men, of course, right? This is something that has nothing to do with language itself. Okay, then you had a word like this. This was the word, this, this was the word hlavdi, someone who makes, a, someone who makes like loaves, this gives you the modern English word lady, lady, right? Lovely. Someone who makes makes loaves. I know a very sexist remark, but shows an original division of labor back then. Now, what was the uh, gender of Lovely? It was feminine. It was feminine. They at least had one word that was applied to women, which was actually a feminine gender noun, right? So, please, people, when you look at an old English noun, it's impossible to determine what the sex, I'm sorry, what the gender of the noun was. You have to, you have to know it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not as bad as it seems. Okay, now, let me ask, ask you, how many, how many cases did old English have? I mean, an old English noun. Anybody, can I have a show of fingers, please? If I ask you how many cases modern English has, the usual answer is this, zero. Case doesn't exist anymore. It only exists as a structural case. Because if you are a noun sitting before a finite verb, then you are, then you are in the nominative. If you are not sitting before a finite verb, you know, a verb that has person number, gender, sorry, person number, uh, uh tense and mood if you are for example the object of a verb or if you are a subject who is not followed by a by a finite verb then you are in the uh, 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 accusative but this is just a uh, this is just structural case you simply don't have any suffixes that actually show this to you now how many suffixes sorry how many cases did old english actually have can i have a show of fingers uh huh. Ah, that would be Indo European. No. Thank you. Four. Old English had four. Yes. Now, let us see them. They were the nominative, the genitive, the dative, and the accusative. Now, let us see a general uh, Old English masculine noun. Let me ask you one 
more think, how, how many numbers did an Old English noun have, typically? Can I have a show of fingers again? Singular and plural, of course, right? Yes. Singular and plural. Let us take a general masculine noun, because you had a number of different uh, classes of masculine nouns. This is the word chlaf. The genitive is right chlafus or chlavus. The dative is actually right chlave, and the accusative is usually identical with the nominative, it's right chlaf. Chlaf. Plural. Nominative was like chlavus. Genitive was chlava. Uh, the dative was chlavum meaning dative, uh, dative plural was clavum, and the accusative plural of a masculine noun that belongs to this particular type is, was identical to the nominative. The pronunciation was clavus. Now, people, let me ask you, which of these suffixes actually survive into modern English in some form? This is a masculine noun. Hmm? Can you see the possessive? VS. VS. What is VS? No, S, S. S, okay. So this one is still found as the so-called genitive, you know, as in John's, Peter's, Mary's, but this is no longer a, a case in modern English. This suffix has actually beca become a determiner. I think we talked about this at the beginning of the session. I mean, not it's from the beginning of the semester. So this one is still found as the genitive, sir. OK, so this one is still so this one is still continued as this. What else? This one is also continued as what? As the general plural suffix, right? I say night uh, tables, desks, bottles, and so on, right? So this is still around. So you'll find it in a word like this, and you will find it in a word like this, right? Bottles. OK, now let me ask you people, do you remember this suffix here? This is the dative plural, and this was actually in this text up here in the word helvonum. Do you remember it, helvonum? Now that's the same suffix. So basically the word helvonum is in dative uh, plural. Now you already start to see how complicated this language was. Let me ask you people, what did this suffix actually depend on? Why did you have to have the dative here? Why was it required? Why not use the genitive? Why not use the Accusative. Why was the dative required? Because of the uh, preposition before it. And the preposition is this one here. It's a preposition on that actually requires you to use the dative of the noun that comes after it. Is that OK? I'm sorry. Uh, Old English was like modern German. If you were to study modern German, this is what you would be doing, right? You would have to remember that the preposition, I don't know, right, meet always goes in the dative. Why? Just because. I have to disappoint you. It is just because, right? OK, let's go on. Uh, let me ask you. So this office is actually dead, right? It doesn't occur anymore. So this, this is just not there anymore. Let me ask you, is this around? This is the genitive plural. This is not fair of me. This suffix is actually found as a zero suffix. Let me ask, ask you people, if you are really interested in this, can you find me the remnant of the old English genitive plural in modern English. This would have to do something with a uh, genitive relationship, like, you know, something of something. 
Does anyone have an idea? And this is something that uh, language learners find very difficult to master, of course, because they are not learning historical linguistics, they are learning synchronic linguistics. Yes, they call it that. In expressions like five o'clock or jack o' lantern? No, no. Uh, no, I have to disappoint you, but 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 that's a lovely example because five five o'clock is actually five of the clock, right? Meaning it is five of a particular piece on the clock. No, how would you say that, for example, your journey lasted five hours? What kind of a journey was that? A five hour journey, journey. exactly, and not a five hours journey. Now that is the remnant of the old English genitive, uh, plural. So if you have it like this, for example, five hour, this is the zero, five hour journey, or for example, I don't know, five foot uh, pole, meaning a pole which is five feet long, but it's not five feet pole. It is not five foot pole. It is five foot pole. Is this OK, people? So actually, very many things survive into modern English. It's only that we don't see them. Why? Because we are not learning uh, diachronic linguistics. We are looking at synchronic ling ling linguistics when we want to learn a language. OK. Let me give you now a typical Old English feminine noun. One of these is this word, like lar. This is a feminine noun. Does anybody know the word? This actually means like teaching. Where does the word survive? What's the name of people's teaching? Folklore. Folklore. So this is the word law, meaning people's teaching, right? Yes. So this is, this survives in a word like this. I'm sorry. Fleur. Okay, so you have it in uh, folklore. So this is the same word here. Now, let's us look at the word lar. Now, lar, okay, let us have the nominative, the genitive, the dative, the accusative. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this doesn't look well. OK. And as you know, this noun will also have a singular and it will have a plural. OK, you have right lar, genitive is lare, dative is lare, accusative is lare. Yes, I know, very boring. Let's go on. The plural is lara, or sometimes it's also found as lare. The genitive is la, uh, lara. The dative is larum. And the accusative is lara. It is actually identical to the nominative or lare. Let me ask, ask you people, can you see a very striking difference between a typical um, masculine noun and a typical feminine noun? the absence of sir. Can you see it? There is no sir in the genitive. There is no sir in the plural. This is what a typical feminine noun looked like in uh, uh, Old English. Of course, you have to know that uh, gender ceased sometime in Middle English, and this was completely forgotten about. That's why, for example, if you have John and Mary, John will, of course, have the Sir, right, John's. Why? Because if you wish, it's a masculine noun, in spite of the fact that it doesn't mean absolutely anything in modern English. And the word Mary will also have Sir. Why? Because uh, uh, gender doesn't exist in modern English anymore. Let me ask you, can you find me? I know this is very difficult. Can you find me examples for old English feminine uh, compounds continued into modern English that have no sir and actually show a genitive relationship? I know it's not fair. I always ask, ask these strange questions. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. 
you have the compound ladybird. I, I hope you know the word ladybird. It's a tiny insect. Why is it called ladybird? Well, it's a bird because it flies, of course, right? Why is it called a lady? It was the bird of Virgin, Virgin Mary, and she is the lady, right? She's the lady of the church, right? Now, why doesn't the word lady actually have a so in it? Why isn't this lady's bird? Because lady used to be a feminine noun, and feminine nouns have no so in the gen in the genitive. Is it okay? Too much information, but it really helps, right? So basically, this one is not this. Ladies, uh, spelled in some word. Why? Because this noun originally was a f f feminine noun, and feminine nouns in the genitive had no sir. Okay. Is it okay? Lovely jubbly, as they say. Now, let me ask, ask you, is anybody a fan of Miss Marple? You don't know what I'm talking about. Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. Does anybody know where Miss Marple actually lives? Ah, I, I know this is not not fair. This is not an exam question. She lives here. Saint Mary Mead. Saint Mary Mead. Do you understand the word Mead? It is right meadow. That's that's an alternative word for meadow. I'm sure you understand scent. That uh, scent, sit. Why doesn't why doesn't Mary have a sir? Because it actually means the uh, meadow of of Saint Mary. Because Mary was a feminine noun. Are you with me? Very good. So there is no sir here. So it's not Saint Mary's mead because Mary was a feminine noun. And feminine nouns had no sir in the genitive singular. As a matter of fact, feminine nouns had no sir at all. OK, let me ask, ask you, can you find me a, a place name? I don't know, somewhere which actually shows an original masculine noun, which would still have the sir in, in the genitive. If you have ever been to London, what is the name of the major uh, railway that, Terminus in London. King's Cross. It's called King's Cross and not King Cross because King was a what what gender noun? Masculine, masculine. noun. Exactly, exactly. A mass masculine noun. So what you actually have is King's Cross. Does anybody know why it's called King's Cross? It is not because of the railways that actually cross there, because there was right a cross uh, erected in name of one of the kings, and we don't even know which king, we just only know it was called King's Cross. Right? So it was actually this, right? King's Cross. Okay, is that okay, people? So if you look at this, Old English still survives, but of course, uh, the changes have been so tremendous indeed that very many aspects of the language actually uh, actually changed right now let me uh, ask you if you have a if you have a neuter noun what should you expect a neuter noun to, to be like is it more like a feminine noun or more like uh, like a masculine noun well it's more like a masculine. It's more like a mas masculine noun. Let me give you an example. This is the word kun. Does anybody know what the word means? And it still survives. Kun. This is the word kin, meaning relationship, right? Kin. So this used to be a uh, neuter noun, and it looked like this. The nominative was kun. The genitive was kunnes. The dative was, oops, I'm sorry, I just can't spell, it seems. The dative was 
kunne, and the accusative, uh, I'm sorry, and the accusative was kun. So, and you see that you still have the genitive sir, which is uh, typical of masculine and neuter nouns, but not of feminine nouns. You have the dative affix here, which is also found in the masculine nouns. It is also found in the f f feminine, that's true. The plural is uh, kun and not kunas. The genitive plural is uh, kunna. The dative is kunnum. And the accusative is kun. Right? You have this um and you have this a. Ah. Okay, now this is what a typical uh, neuter noun looked like. If you ask me, do I have to remember this? This is not really that much, right? This is not really that much and our discussion will help you, of course, right? So please remember, if you look at an old English noun, a masculine noun and a neuter noun will be very similar. You will have the genitive sir in the singular. You will have the dative er. Uh, uh, in the singular, but a feminine noun will be totally different. Why? This is just an Indo-European thing that is continued into uh, common Germanic, which is then continued into Old English. Now, next week we are going to talk about this piece of text because this is not the end of, of our troubles. Oopsie, I'm sorry, this goes back here. Uh, please look at the Lord's uh, Prayer. I am going to upload it into the file section of this Teams. And then we talk about verbs. So for next week, people, please think about how many tenses Old English had, how many persons, how many numbers, how many moods, you know, like indicative, subjunctive, imperative, and where you can actually see them in this particular text. If you look at the early modern English version, it might help you find what is there or, or, or is not there, right? Okay, thank you so much. So we continue with the Lord's Prayer next week and uh, hopefully it will give you another, it will open another big window onto this past stage of English. Okay, people, thank you so much and see you next week. And I am going to um, open a practice quiz exactly on this in uh, Canvas. Okay, thank you so much. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.